By May 1945, the Third Reich was on its last legs. Germany was on the brink of defeat, and surrender was imminent. So, what would happen to all the U-boats that were still in operation, some of them still out on patrol? Well, some of them would be surrendered to the Allied forces, while others would be captured at German-occupied ports, or even out on the open sea. But there was also a concerted effort by the Germans to ensure that the Allies didn't get their hands on all the U-boats. Scores of U-boats would be scuttled on purpose by the Germans in what was known as Operation Regenborgen, or, somewhat ironically, Operation Rainbow. This is the story of Operation Regenbogen, full of drama and intrigue, not to mention the confusion and contradictions that prevailed at the end of World War II. Why did Germany wish to destroy its own U-boats? As stated, Germany was collapsing by May 1945. It was being assaulted by Allied forces from every front, be they American and British forces from the West or Soviet forces from the East. Berlin had been captured by the Soviets, and Hitler had ignominiously committed suicide in his bunker on April 30th. German ports were on the brink of being overwhelmed by the Allies. The Anglo-Canadian 21st Army Group was on the brink of capturing the all-important main port of Hamburg and other key German ports on the North Sea and Baltic Sea. The Kriegsmarine was in no shape to offer resistance, given that all of its capital ships had been destroyed, apart from one exception, the heavy cruiser, Prince Eugen, which was being sheltered in Copenhagen Harbor in German-occupied Denmark. Germany's surface ship fleet had never been as mighty as that of the British or Americans, but what it once had now lay ruined. The only arm of the Kriegsmarine that remained functional at that time was its U-boat division. Nearly 470 U-boats still remained, of which 170 were operational and mainly based in what was still occupied Norway. A further more than 200 U-boats were based mainly in North German ports along the Baltic Sea in various stages of being built, commissioned, or worked up. And then there were those actively out on patrol in the Atlantic Ocean or Baltic Sea. Karl Dönitz had taken over as president of what was left of the Third Reich, having been appointed as such by Hitler days before the latter killed himself. Dönitz was hard at work trying to broker the articles of Germany's surrender to the Allies. However, we need to remember that before Dunitz took over as president, he had been the head of the Kriegsmarine, and before that, he had been chief commander of the U-boat division. Dunitz had always been a Navy man through and through, and his beloved submarine division had always been his biggest passion. So, as much as Dunitz wanted to secure as best a surrender as possible for Germany, he was not about to give up all his U-boats just like that. There's no doubt that a deep sense of honor played a significant role in the German wish to scuttle its U-boats, particularly for a proud naval officer like Dönitz. After all, the almost mythical submarine division had been the pride of Germany's navy or Kriegsmarine, not to mention a deeply personal project over many years for Karl Dönitz. It should therefore be no surprise whatsoever that the Germans devised their plan to scuttle as many U-boats as possible, rather than surrender them. The result was Operation Regenbogen, which in German was officially designated as Regenbogen Basile, or Rainbow Order. According to some historians, the order to commence the operation was given by Donitz on April 30, 1945. By the way, this was the second time that Germany had instituted an Operation Regenbogen. That operation, which turned into a fiasco for the Germans, took place in the Arctic on the last day of 1942. This channel has a video about that first Operation Regenbogen, also known as the Battle of the Barents Sea, so be sure to check it out if you like after this video. For those of you who might not know, to scuttle a vessel is to sink it on purpose, typically by opening up a hole in its hull or bottom side, or by doing so at its sides. This can be achieved by means of packing it with explosives. In wartime, this is very often done to ensure that enemy forces don't take possession of a vessel. The German operation to scuttle or otherwise destroy their U-boats commenced as early as May 1, 1945, in which three U-boats were wrecked at Warnemünde, near Rostock on Germany's Baltic coast. The next day, May 2, a further further 32 U-boats were scuttled at Travemünde, near Lübeck. Political context is crucially important to better understand German motivations in those early days of May. Remember, Germany was in the midst of negotiating its terms of surrender to the Allies. 
efforts by the German contingent to secure a final surrender with Field Marshal Montgomery in France on May 3rd had not been entirely successful. Coincidentally, the German negotiating team in France had been led by Hans-Georg von Friedeberg, about whom there is a video on this channel. You should check that video out as well sometime as it also covers his son, Ludwig Ferdinand, who happened to be the youngest ever U-boat commander. Now back to Operation Regenbogen. The negotiations of May 3rd had not gone according to the plans of Karl Dönitz, the now president of Germany, and so, surely not by chance, on that very day, even more U-boats were destroyed, with 32 scuttled at Kiel, which was Germany's primary naval base during the war, and another seven at Hamburg, Germany's largest port. It was on the next day, May 4th, that the Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower, formally allowed Germany to surrender all its forces to Field Marshal Montgomery. However, among others, the Allies had one stringent demand. They insisted that all German naval vessels be surrendered and intact. That included the U-boat division. That demand would come into effect the next day, May 5th, at 8 a.m. Did the Germans comply with that demand? Hardly, since four more U-boats, two in the Kiel Canal and two at Flensburg, were scuttled on May 4th alone. The official orders by German High Command for Operation Regenbogen came into effect in the early hours of the morning of May 5th, literally hours before the demands by the Allies came into effect. However, that order to commence Operation Regenbogen was cancelled just eight minutes later. The Dutch naval historian Dan van der Vaat stated the exact time that the order was given as being 1.34 a.m. on May 5th, with its retraction just eight minutes later at 1.42 a.m. The Dutch historian stated the retraction was by Dönitz himself. So why did the Germans go back on the order to commence Operation Regenbogen after just eight minutes? It's assumed that the Germans suddenly realized they didn't want the operation to jeopardize any further concessions by the Allies with ongoing negotiations regarding the surrender. Or perhaps Dönitz only got wind of it after the order had gone out and promptly reversed the command. Later that same day, May 5th, German High Command ordered that all operational U-boats were to cease hostilities with immediate effect. That seemed to confirm that the Germans wanted to show that demands made by the Allies regarding U-boats were being met. That too must surely have come from the highest levels, meaning Karl Dönitz, the president. But were those demands respected? It hardly seems so, when one considers the evidence. How then does that explain why no less than 87 U-boats were destroyed on May 5th? That's correct, 87. Of that number, 64 were scuttled in the Baltic Sea, with 41 U-boats destroyed at Gelting Bay, 13 at Flensburg, and the remaining 10 at various other locations on the Baltic coast. The remaining 23 U-boats scuttled that day were on the North Sea coast, with 13 boats scuttled at Wilhelmshaven and 10 in the Weser estuary near Bremen, also on the German North Coast. So 87 U-boats were destroyed on the very day that Allied demands that they remain intact came into force. Was this doublespeak on the part of Dönitz, pretending to say one thing to placate the Allies while secretly allowing his navy to go ahead and scuttle U-boats? Or was there dissension in the ranks, with commanders all over the place doing what they want, against the orders of their high command and Dönitz himself? The latter seems very unlikely. Even in those chaotic last days of the war, it surely wouldn't be possible for so many submarines to be scuttled without the knowledge and acquiescence of Dönitz himself. And most officers are loath to go against the orders of their superiors, even when capitulation to the enemy is underway. There's also the fact that Operation Regenbogen had actually been ordered by Dönitz on April 30th, as already stated, how that tallies up with the subsequent reorder and then quick retraction regarding the operation is confusing to say the least. Perhaps U-boat commanders really did go against the orders of their high command on May 5th, although once again it's hard to believe that the commanders of so many U-boats would decide to do so simultaneously in direct defiance of orders not to do so. No amount of research allows one to make a definitive proclamation of how exactly the orders regarding Operation Regenbogen went down. What we do know is that Dönitz actively wanted as many U-boats scuttled as possible in those days between April 30th and May 4th. It's clear he tried to give his U-boat commanders as many days as possible to do the scuttling while negotiations went on with the Allies. 
It's what exactly happened on May 5th that made 87 commanders scuttle their U-boats that is still disputable. Germany did finally surrender, unconditionally, on May 8th, 1945. This was just days after the mass scuttling of U-boats by Germans in what has been dubbed the May Massacre by some historians. German High Command made it clear that no more U-boats were to be scuttled. The official communication to all U-boat commanders on May 8th read as follows, Neither sink nor destroy U-boats. Only through them can hundreds of thousands of German lives be saved. All remaining naval vessels, including all U-boats, were surrendered to the Allies after that date. It's believed 150 U-boats were surrendered by the Germans, with 98 of the submarines lying in ports, mostly in Norway and at bases in Denmark, France, and Germany itself. The remaining 52 U-boats were either out on patrol or in transit back to bases, and were therefore surrendered to the Allies at sea. Not every U-boat surrendered just like that. Two subs, U-1277 and U-963, fled to the waters just off the coast of Porto in northern Portugal and Nazaré in central Portugal, where they were scuttled by their German crews before said crews were taken in as prisoners of war. Two other subs went even further afield and famously fled all the way to Argentina before they too surrendered themselves to authorities in those ports. Those subs, U-530 and U-977, were not scuttled by their crews but rather taken into American custody once the Germans stepped ashore in Argentina. They would eventually be scuttled by the Americans, of course. This channel has actually done a video dedicated to the fascinating story of U-977, one of the two submarines that fled all the way to Argentina before allowing itself to surrender. It's a really good one, so check it out if you like. So, how many U-boats were destroyed by the Germans? The honest answer regarding how many U-boats were scuttled by Germany is this. One cannot say for absolute certain. The number that is usually touted is 195 U-boats scuttled. However, numbers vary between different historians. For example, the English historian Anthony Kemp believes the number was 218 scuttled U-boats. The American historian Eugene Tarrant gives the same number. However, the American submarine specialist Clay Blair Jr. puts the number at 222, although the number 195 seems to prevail with the majority of other historians. But why the discrepancies in this final number of U-boats scuttled? Part of the reason could be that many U-boats were either not yet in commission, while others had been decommissioned. This lack of definition regarding all U-boats made knowing exactly which were scuttled versus those handed over to the Allies very tricky, even impossible. Also, some historians make an effort to include all U-boats, regardless of their commission or operational status at the end of the war, while other historians do not. In the end, the true number of U-boats that were destroyed by the Germans or surrendered to the Allies is not that important. What is true is that the final demise of the U-boat submarine was undoubtedly the end of a timeless class of naval vessel, undoubtedly the most iconic submarine of all. One can only reflect on all those submarines that were scuttled to the depths of the Atlantic Ocean and Baltic Sea. One can even get nostalgic about the end of the U-boat era, even if one must still acknowledge all the enormous destruction and loss of life caused by those German submarines.